2017. Happy New Year. Come on. Huh? Woo. Another year. And, you know, it wasn't, you know, I know that may not be exciting to all of you, but when you're 69, another year is a wonderful thing. It just keeps getting more wonderful all the time. And, and I'm so excited to not only be at Christ Fellowship on January 1st, 2017, but I'm so, so excited because Church United, uh, the churches throughout this whole region of Florida, along with Christ Fellowship, they've all come together and they're pulling their resources together and they're, they're uniting and they're, they're realizing that as, as a group of congregations throughout this region, they can make such a difference. And so it's great to not only be here at Christ Fellowship, but it's great to know that many of our churches and congregations throughout this region are uh, using this lesson today to start their new year. And, and for each one of you congregations in this area, God bless you. May this be the best year of your life. May this be the best year for your family. May this be the best year for your church. That's what we want for you, okay? All right. Here we go. I want to talk today on, on my prayer for 2017. Every year when I go to the new year, I ask God to give me a prayer, and, and my prayer is very simple. I'll give it to you, and then I want to read a passage of Scripture, then I want to teach from it. My prayer is very simple, and that is that, that you and I would possess the same passion that Paul possessed to reach people for Jesus Christ, because Paul was passionate about reaching people. And I thought to myself, what, what could be better than in 2017, every believer that has listened to this lesson right now would win somebody to Christ, would, would bring somebody into the kingdom. Wouldn't it be just a, an incredible year for you to, to be able at the end of this year to say, I know that I personally led somebody to Christ. I influenced somebody to come into the kingdom. So you're going to see the passion of Paul right now and him reaching people in this passage that's on the screen, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 through 23. Even though I'm free of the demands and expectations of everyone, I have voluntarily become a servant to any and all in order to reach a wide range of people, religious, non-religious, meticulous moralist, loose living immoralist, the defeated, the demoralized, whoever. I didn't take on their way of life. I kept my bearings in Christ, but I entered their world and tried to experience things from their point of view. I've become just about every sort of a servant there is in my attempts to lead those I meet into a God-saved life. I did all this because of the message. I didn't just want to talk about it. I wanted to be in on it. Paul's passion, number one, changed him. And I know that because in, as he starts this teaching off, he, he just says, even though I am free of the demands and the expectations of everyone, I have voluntarily become a servant to any and to all. What, what did Paul say? Paul says, I'm a free person, I'm free in Christ. And I'm free to go to the left, I'm free to go to the right, I'm free to go forward, I'm free to go backward, I can go upward, I can go downward, I'm free. But he says, I can't live a free life. Because what I need to do is I need to reach people, and, and so what I need to do is I have to become a servant to any and to all. What Paul is saying is, if I'm going to be effective in, in bringing people to the kingdom, I have to put people first that I have to constantly think of them and adding value to them. I can still remember uh, in my 20s uh, going with my father and, and my brother to, to hear Zig Ziglar for the first time in Dayton, Ohio, and we were on the front row, and I'll never forget that great motivating speaker with that southern draw would walk around the stage, and he kept saying over and over again, if you'll help people get what they want, they'll help you get whatever you want. And I remember as a leader, I thought, man, I've been doing it wrong. I've been wanting everybody to get on my train. I've been wanting everybody to get into my vision. I'm not finding them where they are and, 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 and connecting with them. And, and so I've got to change things. I've got to, I've got to quit putting me first. I've got to start putting them first. Well, I, I know it kind of dawned on me when Zig said it, but when you really think about it, if you want to be Christ-like, somebody comes and says, John, I would just like to be like Jesus. Well, th that's so easy. If you want to be like Jesus, just put others first. 
and add value to them every day. That's, that's Christ-like. That's, that's Jesus-like. 2017, I'm living a Jesus-like life. I'm putting others first. I'm adding value to them. And, and you say, boy, John, do you think that's just Jesus-like? I know it's Jesus-like. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. This is powerful stuff. Look what Paul says. If you've gotten anything out of all at following Christ... In his love, if his love has made any difference in your life, if being in a community of the Spirit means anything to you, if you have a heart, if you care. Wow, he's kind of qualifying it, isn't he? If, 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 if. Then do me a favor. Agree with each other. Love each other. Be deep-spirited friends. Don't push your way up to the front. Don't sweet-talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside and help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. Then he says, I think I'm going to illustrate what I've just told you to do. Think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. He had equal status with God, but he didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status no matter what. No, not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave, became human. Having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life and then died a selfless, obedient death and the worst kind of death at that, a crucifixion. All Paul is saying is very simple. If you want to be like Jesus... Just do what Jesus did. Give it all up for others. That's being Christ-like. But Paul's passion not only changed him. The second thing that is Paul's passion did for him is, is, it, it, is it caused him to include everyone. His passion had no territory, had no turf, had no fences around it. He says, I have voluntarily become a servant to any and to all. In order to reach, I love this this phrase, a wide range of people. He says, I want to reach religious people. I want to reach non-religious people. I want to reach meticulous moralists. I want to reach loose living immoralists. I want to reach the defeated. I want to reach the demoralized. And, and he's finally, he's just trying to express all the people he wants to reach because he wants to reach them all. And then finally, he just, he just sums up one word, whoever. Whoever, that just kind of does it. Paul, who do you want to reach? Whoever. Just bring them on. I just, any type, any shape, any place, any person, anywhere. Just, I, just, I just want to win them. You know, it's a wonderful thing to realize how much God loves us. It's it's wonderful for us to think of how much God values us. In fact, I want you to repeat with me, would you please? Because I just love this. Because this this just makes me, whenever I say this, it just makes me me really feel privileged. I want you all to, as, as as a group, say with me, God loves me. God loves me. Oh, that's good. Now look at your neighbor and say, God loves you. Isn't that great, huh? And then say it all together. God loves people I don't know. God. Isn't that great? I mean, people you and I don't even know God loves. I want one more thing. Say with me, God loves people I don't like. Your tone was a little different on that last one. Didn't some faces just kind of flash up before you? Don't you sometimes just kind of feel like Jonah? Oh, come on, God. Give it to him. Give it to him. I mean, I mean, they repented and he repented. I mean, he just kind of felt bad about it. He's just, he was hoping that a little destruction could happen. I mean, not to everybody, but I mean the real bad ones. The real bad ones. You see, we have a question we've got to ask ourselves as a church. There's a question I have to ask myself every day as I'm out into a secular world. And the question is this, do I want to connect with people or do I want to correct them? And you better figure it out because you can't do both. I think most of the people outside would say we're better at correcting than we are connecting. And and, and you say, well, John, who do I connect with? Well, if you want to be like Jesus, 
God should love the whole world. Or if you want to be like Paul, whoever, then you say, who should I connect with? Anybody that's around you. Everybody. And, 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 and let me say, for 2017, take that phrase, everybody, because that's kind of like big. And we, it's get a little overwhelming. Take everybody and just reduce it to somebody. Let me ask you a question. Who would you in 2017 like to bring into the kingdom of God? What, what, what one person would you like to be an influence on? And how do, we, how, do we, how do we connect with them? It's very simple. Paul tells us, Jesus tells us, Christ-like, serving people, adding value to them intentionally. So the passion of Paul, it changed him. He went from somebody who could do anything he really wanted to do to say, no, I think I'm going to serve and add value. So it just changed everything about his life. But it not only, it not only changed him. When he got that passion, it included everybody. He, it didn't stop at any line for somebody that just was kind of, quote, disgusting to him. And by the way, can I tell you why he had no lines there? Because he was a murderer. When you've done something really bad, when Jesus changes your life, you love people that do things really bad. Number three, his passion established his identity. Look what Paul says. I love this. Don't miss this, Christians. This is, this is key to being salt and light. He said, I didn't take on their way of life. I kept my bearings in Christ. In other words, he says, now I want to reach him. But to reach him, I don't have to become like him. Now, let me say something. You got to like him. Christians have a hard time with that. You just got to like him. But you don't have to become like him. You, you want to be Christ-like. Are you with me? He said, I, I didn't lose my bearings. I didn't lose my way of life. I, I, I focused on Christ. I understood that. Now listen to me very carefully because I'm going to make a statement that is absolutely true. Birthed out of my own transition from a pastor to living every day, basically trying to reach people for God in a secular world. Listen very carefully. You truly find out who you are when you have to leave your culture. Now you need to go home and spend about five hours on that statement. You truly find out who you are when you have to leave your culture, your surroundings, your friends, your church service, all the things that make us so comfortable as Christ followers. You never know. You never know just truly who you are until you have got to leave your world and get into their world. When I was 17, I, I really made a, a strong commitment to Christ. And I can still remember, it was during my school year, my, my junior year of high school. And, and I knew that I had to let my friends know that, that Christ had become real in my life. But like all new Christians, I wasn't really sure how to do that. And I was a little clumsy. And, and, and so I just I decided after a couple of days, I had a little testament just to put it in my pocket of my shirt. Not say anything, but just carry a, a New Testament in my pocket. And if somebody asked me, I could just tell them that I was a Christ follower. And, and I like to read the New Testament and follow the Christ. And I'll never forget, the first morning that I did that, I walked into my homeroom, and as soon as I walked into my homeroom, Jack Martin, who was in my room, looked at me, and, and he looked at, he said, John, what is that? And I said, oh, that's a New Testament. I said, I, I, I became a Christian this week. At 17, I understood something. When you enter their world, you better know who you are. And that day I said to myself, I will live with them, but I never need to ever want to forget who I am in Christ. And so in the crossover, I keep asking myself when I left the pastorate and, and went in, in, into teaching in the business community, I kept asking myself, why am I crossing over? Very simple, I'm crossing over. I'm crossing over to reach people for Christ. That's the only reason I'm doing it. And so I keep saying to myself constantly, John, don't forget who you are. And so I look at people and I say, hey, my name's John. I'm your friend. 
I look up and say, I came here to add value to people. No other agenda, just want to add value to people. And every opportunity I get, when the opportunity comes, doesn't come every time, it's, it's yes, I'm, I'm a person of faith, but hey, I came to add value to you too. I'm not, I'm not here to talk about my faith. I'm here to add value to you. I'm here to take care of you. I'm here to, I'm here to make your company better. I have, I'm here to help you go climb this ladder of success. But also, not only forget who, don't forget who you are, John, but don't forget why you're in the world. The church has forgotten why we're here. We think we're here to sing kumbaya till Jesus comes. And we're here to be salt and light. That's why we're here. And, and as, as, as Christ followers, I, you, all of us, we need to constantly be reminded, we are here for one reason. And that is to get the bride ready. To, hey, hey, that when Christ comes back, we, we've got people, to, we got a people to take with us. On my, on my iPhone, I'm not very technical, but I love the salt and light passage because Jesus said that's what we're to be, salt and light. And so when I turn on my little iPhone, baby, I mean, I got my right, oh, shoot, I got a crazy message right there. Turn. All right, if I can get rid, anyway, that just killed a great illustration. Wasn't the first time, won't be the last time. Welcome to the life of a public speaker. I'm going to try it one more time. It's a little light bulb and a salt shaker. And it just says, be these. Just be these. Be salt and light, John. That's, that's, that, that's who you are. Number four, Paul's passion challenged him to enter their world and get out of his comfort zone. His passion challenged him to enter their world and get out of his comfort zone. What did he say? But I entered their world... And I tried to experience things from their point of view. This is, this, this, I love this passage. I entered their world and I tried to experience things from their point of view. You see, as Christians, we're always wanting everybody to know our point of view. We're always wanting to declare ourselves. Could you just quit declaring yourself? Just, just get over into their world and do your very best to enter that world and begin to see things from their point of view. See, when I know who I am and what I need to do, then I need to know who they are. Now, I live in this world. And I can give you illustration after illustration of how God has helped me to understand how they see God. Not how the church sees God, but how they see God. I've got a wonderful friend in, in, in 2016 and going into 2017 now, I'm on, I'm on, I'm, I've got a wonderful, interesting project with an atheist. Um, by the way, I hope you got a whole bunch of sinner friends. I, I think, I don't know, I think that, I don't know, maybe that people shouldn't be able to go to church until they've got like 25 sinner friends. <laughs> you lose your sinner friends and you lose your passion to reach them for Christ. So I've got an atheist, and, and every other month I call him. And, uh, and we've talked about a lot of things. I've helped him add a lot of value to his company, to his business. And so uh, we, we started to move towards the agenda a couple of months ago. And I said, what, what do you want the agenda to be for the next few months? And he said, okay. He said, now, John, you know I'm an atheist. I said, I know you are. I know you are. He said, I would like to talk about the historical Jesus. I said, I like that. He said, not the biblical one. Don't want to do Bible. The historical Jesus. I said, I got it. I, I think historical Jesus would be a good one. Let's do that. So we've, we've now been into three phone conversations an hour each time on the historical Jesus. Now, I'll take them wherever they give them to me. F folks, folks, quit trying to move them around. Quit, what, what are we doing? Go find them where they are and stay with them until they're comfortable. Listen. They're not going to be comfortable with you until you're comfortable with where they are. And too many Christians aren't comfortable with where they are, and so they get nervous. It's not historical Jesus. That works. Historical Jesus. Let's talk about it. So we're in our third phone conversation. He said, now, John, I said, I'm going to tell you why I'm an atheist. He said, now, this is one of the main reasons. I said, good. What is it? He said, well, he said, I just can't believe in a God that would send people to hell. And I called him by name and I said, oh my gosh, I so agree with you on that. And it got real quiet. He said, what do you mean you agree with me? 
Why? I said, I, I think you're exactly right. I surely would, I couldn't believe in a God that would just send people to hell. We said, what do you mean? That's your God. Oh, I said, no, that's not my God. <laughs> Somebody's giving you some bad information. I said, that's, that's not my God. Yeah, I said, let me, let me explain something to you. There is a hell. But my God, he's exactly opposite of the God you're thinking about. My God does everything he can do in his power to keep you from going there. In fact, he's so bent on keeping you from going to such a terrible place that he gave up his own son. And he not only gave up his own son, but, but he also he loves us unconditionally. And, and I started going through this whole process, and, and he gave us a way, a way of salvation so that we wouldn't have to go there. In fact, I said, let me explain this to you. I called him by name. I said, just got to understand, if you go to hell, you have to step over God to get there. He said, I've never thought of it like that. I said, I know you haven't. You're my friend. I said, you're not an atheist. You just think you are. <laughs> but it's okay. It's okay. It, it makes you comfortable. I, I love atheists. Atheists, fine. But I said, you're not an atheist. You're just an atheist because there's a false God that you don't believe in. And I said, now, today's not the day. But there's going to be a day when you're going to want to know the real one. And when you're ready, I'll talk to you about it. But it's not today. It's not today. It's not today. I can still remember when I crossed over and I, one of my first speaking gigs was with Sam's Club. And so I talked to the executives. I spoke all day for Sam's Club at the convention center in, in Tampa. And, and so I spoke to kind of the leaders there. That, and I said, could we do like a volunteer service tomorrow morning, you know, for people who just like to come and I could just maybe share faith a little bit with them. And I said, make it volunteer. Didn't have to be anybody. And, and I said, do it, do it before you start your schedule. Well, if you know anything about Sam's Club, Walmart, they start early. I mean, they start really early. And so they, they said, yeah, we'll let you do that. It's all volunteer. They said, it, it, it'll, 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 have to, it'll have to be at six in the morning. I can still remember walking from my hotel three blocks to the convention center at 530 and I was so incredibly discouraged and defeated because I thought, who is going to come out at six in the morning? And by the way, when you go into my world, you don't get worship on the front end. Some of your worship teams are so good, you don't even have to preach good and somebody can get saved. You could just get up and say, hickory dickory dock and five people will come forward. And as I walked that walk, those few blocks over to the convention center, I understood that day that I was lonely because I entered their world. And when you enter their world, you'll be lonely because you're in the world, but you're not of the world. Number five, Paul's passion helped him to become creative. His passion to reach people gave him a creative edge that I just love. What did he say? I've, I've become just about every sort of a servant there is in the attempt to lead those I meet into a God-saved life. Now, when he said, I've become just about any kind of servant there is, here's what Paul said. Paul says, I look at people and I ask myself, what do I got to do to add value to them? And oh, this, this person, I got, okay, that's the kind of servant I'll be for them. Oh, what I, oh that, I'll be that kind of In other words, Paul said, my whole life is directed not upon what I know, but upon where they are. You've got to find them before you can lead them. You see, I grew up in a holiness church where they just wanted you to be holy. And I went back and spoke for their 100th anniversary. And I said, I thank God for my heritage. Holiness is a beautiful thing. But I said, I just got to tell you something. You got to catch the fish before you clean the fish. You got a bunch of fish cleaners. And they haven't caught anything for a long time. See, the key to creativity is this. Creative people, they're not like brilliant, like above other people. 
Creative people are creative because there's one thing they all have in their DNA, and it's very simple. All creative people believe one thing, there is always an answer. You show me a creative person, they believe there's an answer. The moment you don't think there's an answer, guess what? You quit being creative. Creativity is stimulated on the fact there's always an answer. And Paul said, there's always a way to reach people for Christ. There's always a way for me to be creative. I become all thanks to all men. I can win some. Okay, what's your need? Okay, that's the kind of servant I am with you. Oh, I'm that kind of a servant over there with you. Oh, I add value to you that way. All I got to do is find out where you are. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to connect with you. So when I do the four pictures of God, when I do the four pictures of God, people come to me and say, John, where did you ever come up with that idea? from hanging around with sinners and getting their point of view about God. See, we're telling them all kinds of things about God that they never thought about. You see, when I started hanging around sinners, one of the first things I found is that there were a lot of people, they just thought God wasn't reachable. So I put a fence in the picture and showed them that God would hop the fence to have a relationship with them. And when I started hanging around with lost people, I found a whole bunch of them said, well, I'm just not a good enough person. So I said, well, let's talk about a garbage can. And let's talk about how fact God loves garbage. And I talked to somebody who said, well, I am a good enough person and I'm working hard and, and I'm better than most people anyway and I'm, I'm a good person and I'm climbing this ladder. So I said, let's stick a ladder. Can I tell you, the four pictures of God is nothing but hanging around with lost people. When's the last time your best thoughts were not your thoughts? but were the thoughts of lost people so that you could understand them, connect with them, and then bring them into the kingdom. So I'm always, I'm so creative. I am so stinking creative. And I'm good. I mean, I'm really good. People hear me all the time and say, John, you're so good. You see, the Bible says, he that winneth souls is wise. I never, when I, before I started winning people to Christ, I didn't know that. I kept thinking, how do you get wise winning souls? Then I found out. You go out and start sharing your faith with lost people, they'll ask you questions you don't know. You're not in Sunday school now, everybody happy. And they'll ask you questions. You know, and when they would ask me questions I know, didn't know, I'd say, you know what, I don't know. But if you give me a week, I'll go find the answer. I'll come back and talk to you again about it. After you do that for about five years, you got all the answers. And one day you say, yeah, he that wins souls is wise. Where did you get wise? You got wise by hanging around and trying to connect and lead people to Jesus. That's the wisdom you get. So I'm creative. So when I'm talking to the business world, I say, now, there are four ways to add value to people. And, and for you today, I'm going to give you three of them. And so I give them the three of them, and, and I just look at their face. And sometimes they'll say, well, what's the fourth one? Oh, I, say, I can't give that to you. That's not for you. That's just for me. I, there are four ways I add value to people, but, but I'm a person of faith, and, and, and I don't want to mix that in with, 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 with my business teaching today. Drives them crazy. <laughs> Many times they just, they just they demand. I, I say, okay, okay I'm going to tell you. You just asked for it, so I'm going to tell you, but we're not going to talk about it. In fact, if you don't want to hear it, just don't listen to me on this one. I'm here to tell you, when the world knows you got something that they need, they'll hang around with you to try to figure out what it is. And I learned how to bait the hook. <laughs> so when I'm talking about, if I could spend a day with you, I have a seminar that, that literally when I have an all day, when I could do about seven hours, I do five things that I, if I could spend one day, you and I sat around the table and I could only, I was only going to see you once. This is my day. And when I'm done, I'll never see you again. These are the five most important things I talk to you about your life to be successful. They love this seminar, but I only give them four because this, honestly, I can't give you the fifth one because if, if I could, I would. I would talk about my faith because those are the things that live beyond you. I, I promise you every time I do that, 20, 30, 40, 50 people come say, what, what would you say? What, what, what is that thing you would say uh, 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 about your faith? Can I tell you something? The world is hungry. We don't have a hunger problem with the world. We've got a Christian problem who doesn't understand the world enough to even know how to make them hungry. And Paul knew it. And Paul said, my passion 
to reach people makes me creative. I, I, I teach about who luck. I say the best kind of luck you can have in life is who luck, who you know, who you meet. My gosh, that's better than any other kind of luck. You want to, and, and so I said, let me tell you how to get who luck. When you have a meeting with somebody you admire, ask them, who do you know that I should know? And can you help me to know them? I mean, I've met presidents of, of, of the United States asking that question. I met John Wooden asking that question. I've, I can give you 50 great people I asked, but, but just said, who do you know that I should know? So I teach him. I say, and so I'll get around and I'll say, okay, let's talk about who luck. Every one of you talk about who you know that the rest of us in this group should know. I mean, I ask questions all the time because if you ask questions, you set the whole conversation up, whether it's a dinner or any other kind of meeting. And so they'll go around, they'll say, well, I know this person, I know this person. And they come to me and I say, oh my gosh, I want to go last because I've been even debating if I should tell you about this. So I'm just going to say it, but let's not talk about it. You see, if, if you ask me who I know that you should know, I, I'd say, boy, I wish you knew God because he's amazing. And what he's done in my life is amazing. But, but let's go on now. Let's not talk about it anymore. A lot of times in Q&A, somebody will say, who's the greatest leader that ever lived? Well, okay. It's just from a historical point of view. I'm a person of faith. But Jesus was the greatest leader that ever lived. Now, let me tell you something. I could give you 50 things like this that I do every day of my life. And you say, how do you get so smart? How do you get so creative? How can you have all those hooks? How do you know those things? I'll tell you what. I hang around with lost people. It's not good for Christians to hang around with Christians. Listen to me. My name's John. I'm your friend. When you go to heaven, you get to hang around with Christians for eternity. <laughs> Here's a thought. While you're on earth and we're supposed to get the bride ready, let's start hanging with some sinners. Number six, Paul's passion allowed him to love and live out this incredible message. His passion allowed him not only to love the message, he could live it out. What did he say? I did all of this because of the message. I didn't just want to talk about it. I wanted to be in on it. I love that. I didn't want to just talk about it. I want to, get, I want to dive. I don't want to just have another Bible study about reaching people, my neighbors for Christ. Worthless. Worthless. We are educated in the church way beyond the level of our obedience. And the only transformation comes not from intellectual teaching. Transformation comes from application. Transformation does not happen until you act upon what you know. We're, the greatest gap in the world is a gap between knowing and doing. I was recently given this uh, to me by a person that I helped to uh, reach for Christ. And it was a little poem that I never heard, heard before. It's kind of simple, and I've just kind of been hanging on to it. But the poem says, when you enter that beautiful city and the, the saved all around you appear, what joy when someone will tell you, it was you who invited me here. I was privileged last month, a couple of months ago now, to, to, to have a, a brief audience with the Pope. And because I knew I was going to have some time with him, I wanted to get him a gift. And, and he, he took on the name Francis because Pope Francis admires St. Francis of Assisi. And so I said, I would love to take him something on St. Francis of Assisi. And, and there's a bookstore in New York City that I love that all has this old, great, great books, great books. I go there every time. And, and so I had Linda call them up. And sure enough, they had, a, they had an old book of St. Francis, Francis of Assisi of woodblock cuttings, pictures of him, 54. And it was the only one in the world. And I bought it. And I was so excited and to take that and give it to Pope Francis and all the time and the effort and the energy to, to give him a gift that I knew would really, you know, connect with him. And, and uh, it was kind of a good time for us. And when I left him, I said, there's going to be a day when I um, stand before Jesus. And I began to ask myself the question. I mean, I kind of worked hard on the gift for Pope Francis. 
What's, what's going to be my gift when I stand before him? First of all, it's not going to be me. Um, when I look at people that love God, I know a lot of people love him more than I do, and I know a lot of people live a much better Christian life than I do. And I, I look at people who have given their life up for the cause of Christ, and, and I just look, I look at some Christians and just say, you know, there's got to be some kind of a, I don't know, an overflow somewhere in heaven where you kind of watch by satellite. And I'm probably going to be hanging there somewhere. But I know what I want to give Jesus. I do know this. Um, when I stand before him, thank him for what he's done for me. I would just like to have people around me that I can say, Jesus, I just want you to know. I help bring them into the kingdom. And they're up here today because... Um, I tried to be what you wanted me to be, salt and light. I don't want to stand before the one who gave his life for me. Empty-handed. Said, hey, Jesus, just got saved myself and here I am. No. I want to look at him and say, what you did not only changed my life, but what you did changed all these people's lives. In heaven, I want somebody to look at me and say, it was you. It was you who invited me here. Let's pray. You are a wonderful father and you gave us the most wonderful gift, Jesus, who died on the cross for our sins and conquered death gave us the hope of eternal life. And I just pray for every church within this Florida region. I pray for every member of every congregation that is listening to this lesson today. I pray that you will begin with the pastor and then you'll go through the staff and then you'll go through the elders and the lay people. And I just pray that God in 2017, wouldn't it be wonderful at the end of this year, we could look at you and say, there's one person going to heaven that I influenced into the kingdom I led to Christ this year, that if I wouldn't have been here on earth, they wouldn't be ready to meet you. May we stand before you not empty-handed. May we stand before you with people around us, people that have found you in your grace and your goodness and your forgiveness. So I pray a covering of Revival, renewal on every church and on every person in that building. May today we catch fire and in our heart may we get a passion like Paul to become all things to all men and all women that we might win some. We ask in the name of Jesus and everybody said amen. God bless you.